afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Today's webinar, as Anna already mentioned, this is about uh, evidence-based research, and uh, this will be presented by Cost Action C17117 towards an international network for evidence-based research in clinical health research. And uh, this action is established like network aiming to raise awareness of uh, the need to use of systemic reviews uh, when planning new studies and when placing new results in context, encouraging to the use of an evidence-based research approach while carrying out and supporting clinical research. And it will be presented by Cost Action Chair, Vice Chair, a working group leader, and also Cost uh, Communication uh, Coordinator. Uh, so we have here Hans Lund, uh, and uh, he's the chair of the action, and he will uh, start uh, the, the, his presentation with problem when justifying new studies. Please, Hans. Thank you very much, Inga. I will just share the screen here, just one second. Uh, let's see uh, if we do like this. I hope everyone can see the full screen here now. So uh, we will actually like to uh, give a little short story here. So imagine you are having a very great idea for a new study. I can give you an example you can use as a great idea. Oh, maybe this this medical drug here, Propofol, can, can help you with the general anesthesia. When you are having a surgery, you are getting uh, pain on the injection for, for, for this general anesthesia, and, and, and it can be a big problem with the pain. Uh, so there were some studies indicating that maybe if you are using lidocaine, it will maybe diminish the intensity of pain. Uh, and uh, so the purpose of this and the idea of this interesting study was to assess the efficacy of lidocaine on diminishing pain associated with the injection of propofol. Okay, the results was very good. Lidocaine significantly reduced propofol injection pain more than placebo. Uh, you could also say in more than 68% of the cases, it was actually working very well. So congratulations, very good study. But this study here, submitted for publication in 2006, was redundant and completely unnecessary, together with 86 other studies. You know, in 2000, um, there was uh, Picard and Tramere was publishing a systematic review where they included 56 studies they were looking at exactly the same question as the study I was just mentioning, and they were concluding exactly the same. In 2000, six years before the other study I mentioned was published. He actually cited this systematic review, but he only used it to, uh, to state that uh, the pain of injection of propofol has been reported to be 70% of the cases, which is a very high number. The, the author did not mention or use the systematic review in any other way, for example, to tell him that he shouldn't perform the study because we already have the answer to the question. So, so uh, then in 2014, Céline Habra, with one of the authors of the first systematic review, made another systematic review uh, and looked at exactly the same question again. So the results you can see here, you can see all the studies. The first uh, two uh, studies were published in 82 and so forth. So you have actually 56 studies that were included in the systematic review from 2000. And they made a very unambiguous, clear, certain uh, conclusion that it's a good idea to use lidocaine to diminish pain. After the publication of this systematic review, 136 new studies with the same kind of questions were published. Uh, to be fair, 
uh, around 49 of those studies have some twist or have another perspective on the question. So if you are very uh, positive towards this study, you could state that they were maybe clinical relevant. But 87 of those studies were completely redundant and unnecessary. The study I just mentioned in the beginning was one of those uh, 87 redundant study, even though that he was familiar with the systematic review from 2000. So they wrote in the paper that there are numerous examples where systematic reviews, if performed in a timely manner, could have provided evidence of the effectiveness of an intervention and thus prevented redundant research. There is also evidence that knowledge from systematic reviews are underused to inform future research. So if we take the idea and the chain of arguments from this idea that the research has got, the authors should have used a systematic review in this process. When they had the idea formulating the question, they should have looked up and see if there has been some earlier studies for example, by searching for systematic reviews of earlier similar studies. The authors did so, but the systematic review should have been used to justify and design and not just arguing for how big the problem was, and even used to place the results of this new study in the context of existing evidence. So is this a big problem or not? I'll give the floor to Olivia. Yes, thank you. So hello, this is Olivia, uh, and I will talk about the evidence uh, for the problem. Thank you, Hans. Thank you for inviting me to this. Can we have the next slide, please? So this slide talks about uh, very early warnings about the importance of uh, putting the uh, new evidence in the context of the existing evidence. So what you see here uh, in the photo is O'Reilly, uh, who a long time ago warned us that uh, we should not only be concerned with accumulation of new facts, but we should also uh, very, very much attention devote to uh, the problem that uh, we should uh, put the old facts into the context uh, uh, before we try to find new evidence. So the ideal is uh, that each new results should be interpreted in the context of earlier research. Next, please. So the scientific ideal uh, should be summing up the uh, science. And uh, so what we need to do, you know, do we need uh, new research that is better, uh, more insightful or uh, more powerful? Or we simply uh, need first to uh, stand back a little bit and um, uh, to, to check whether uh, all new studies have incorporated and uh, improved upon lessons that we already had. So for science to be cumulative, an intermediate step between past and future research is necessary. And this means the synthesis of existing evidence. So ideal is that all new studies, literally all new studies, should be based on a systematic review of earlier similar studies. So we should not proceed to creating new studies until we have synthesized the previous evidence and made sure that the new evidence uh, is really needed. Next, please. So to sum up, uh, science is a cumulative enterprise. Uh, it is accumulating very fast, uh, but we don't need new studies until we make sure that we really need them. So we always must uh, start, you know, where earlier scientists have stopped. So every part of scientific approach must be done systematically and transparently, simply because the only way to be able to improve it is by making it possible for other scientists to criticize all the steps. So by every part, we include the justification and design of a new study, as well as the interpretation of new results. Next, please. So, you know, something that we always uh, face when we talk about this with other colleagues is uh, that people tell us, but every study has an introduction, you know, every study has a justification for previous research. What do you mean uh, the, the people did not justify, uh, you know, the, the research with uh, old references? So what is the problem? 
the question is when we talk about uh, putting uh, results in context and synthesizing everything we know uh, before, we need to ask what is the evidence? What is the true evidence that we are looking for? So when we look at the, the papers that we have published, uh, so there's a scoping review mapping all the meta research studies, uh, evaluating this problem of redundancy. And the approach to deal with this problem is called evidence-based research. So just like clinicians must use a systematic and transparent approach when making decisions, so must researchers. Uh, and what the results have shown, uh, so in this um, scoping review, 69 meta-research studies were included, 34 evaluated prevalence of redundancy, 42 evaluated prevalence of using an evidence-based research approach. And conclusion was that the, there's a lack of information in most health domains and research topics, indication of a high prevalence of redundancy and a low prevalence of trying to minimize or avoiding redundancy. And there was one study that evaluated whether end users perspective was used to inform justification and design of new study. So the overall evidence is, uh, you know, so when justifying a study, uh, what do you need to do, you know? Uh, so basically, um, you need to justify your study properly by using systematic reviews. So the, the, what the study found uh, is that 58% of uh, analyzed uh, original studies did not use a systematic review to justify their study. And this is something that in uh, EBR approach, the evidence-based research approach, we find highly problematic because uh, when you do synthesis of evidence, this should be a real proof that uh, we have truly assessed the evidence that already exists, and then we can move on further. To, to, to sum up, uh, uh, the, the true evidence uh, for, for new research is a systematic review. Uh, so there, there is an introduction that everybody can write. An introduction, of course, people use uh, all kinds of studies that as an introduction to their story, which leads to their uh, final aim. Uh, but we don't need people to simply sum summarize, um, you know, research from their point of view a little bit. Mm -hmm. What we need to see, uh, you know, is that they have uh, actually uh, either used a, a systematic review that already exists to justify a new study, or what they can also do is they can also perform a systematic review to justify uh, the new study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Livia. Thanks, Hans, for uh, this clear uh, description of problem. Now we'll have uh, Caroline Blaine, Science Communication Coordinator, who will give us this uh, solution uh, to the problem, the evidence-based research concept. Please, Caroline. Um, so we've discussed that there is a problem um, and that something needs to be done about it. And the solution that we're proposing is this evidence-based research approach. Um, so this approach is about being systematic and transparent when you're both justifying and designing any new study. Um, and then also once you've done the study, then those results should be put into the context of the existing evidence, again, being systematic and transparent throughout. And then there's a third part of it, which I'll just discuss very briefly at the end, but to enable this to happen, um, we understand there needs to be a more efficient production updating and dissemination of systematic reviews. So it, we're sort of developing the process, but also looking at sort of obstacles people may have in real life to carrying out this process and what can be done to improve that. Um, so when people are conducting research, um, the sort of top half of the circle is what traditionally has been considered, which is, you know, we have a question that we think is important, looking at their environment and context and the existing um, knowledge base and judging whether a study um, should be um, started on that and whether that question is important. And the EBR approach includes that those more traditional concepts, um, but we add these extra parts, which is that um, to Fully evaluate the necessity and the relevance of a new study, we need to explicitly use all earlier studies, which is where the systematic review comes in, um, but also to consider end user perspective. And then when you bring those all together, then you know that the new research you're creating is adding value. 
So um, this figure is from a paper that we published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. Um, you can see um, the full title if you want to look it up um, on the right hand bottom corner. Um, so this is like an algorithm of the of the EBR approach. Um, and there's basically sort of five stages in this. Most of the stages come before you even consider conducting the study. And then the fifth stage is afterwards. So I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail about identifying research gaps um, and then considering also if that gap is a need, um, how to establish if a research question is justified, how to design the new study and then putting the results into context. So the first step is actually understanding whether there is a gap, um, which means that there's a question that hasn't fully been answered yet by the existing research. Um, and by using a systematic review, there may be an existing one or you may have to conduct a new one if that it doesn't already exist, um, which includes all earlier similar studies, then you can work out whether the new question is actually addressing a gap. Um, the second step is end user, end user perspectives. So um, an end user is anybody that's affected by the results um, or will use the results of your research. Um, and what we suggest is that a qualitative, qualitative evidence synthesis, um, which basically is a systematic review of qualitative studies, um, that you can find um, relevant sort of um, end user needs for the research question. So bringing this all together for the third step um, to consider whether the study is justified. So if you've worked out you've got a research gap, and there's a similar end user need, then you've got a very strong justification for carrying out a new study. Um, but if one of those areas isn't happening, there's not a convincing justification because either the question doesn't need answering because it may not, there may not be a study, but actually people aren't interested in that area in practice, um, or maybe the evidence actually already exists in one way that can be used and you don't need to do a new study. Um, there are considerations, I think, as Han sort of mentioned in that one study where you could say, you know, there were some relevant um, studies that were published even after the question had been answered. And that's pertaining to particular things like um, subgroups, um, whether there's still other important in in interventions or aspects of that intervention that need to be evaluated. Um, whether the comparator is the right one still, or whether we should be changing the, the comparison in those studies, um, whether all the relevant outcomes um, and the length of those outcomes has been assessed, um, and whether those studies are of a, a large enough size to answer the question. Um, so there may be aspects, but again, this is helping to focus what are the questions that still need answering. So the fourth step is designing the study, and it basically was a very similar process to the justification step. So by set, knowing that the study is justified, you will anticipate the design because you'll show the areas where there's gaps and, and where you need to focus your new study. Um, and the EBR approach should inform all elements of the trial design. Um, so it'll help you decide the study type and the size, um, those population intervention, comparison and outcome elements and, and the time frame of the study. Um, because a poorly designed study, even if it's answering a relevant, trying to answer a relevant question, it, it won't meet needs and it will contribute to waste rather than actually answering a question. And then the final step after you've conducted the study is putting those results into context. Um, so it's about assessing um, the change to magnitude and precision of the effect when adding the new study to all the existing evidence so far. How do the results affect the conclusion and level of certainty we have in that answer to that question? And is it possible to draw a definitive conclusion or are there still gaps? And in that, in that way, you can identify gaps for further research by your group or, or other people that may be interested in continuing this research um, in this area. Um, and then you should formulate the implications and suggestions for future research based on the totality of the evidence and highlighting the contribution of your new study. So I said I'd very briefly also to talk about efficient systematic reviews. Um, and we've actually, in our transparent and systematic way, done a scoping review to look at sort of what the issues may be around systematic review production. Um, so looking at all the evidence there was on resource use, most of the existing evidence focuses on the resource of time um, and time constraints in producing systematic reviews. And they're not always conducted under real life conditions. Um, so how reflective these are of, of the issues people face in real life, um, you know, it, it gives us ideas. 
but but the areas that have shown to be particular problems are around administration and project management. Um, and then the areas of systematic reviewing itself, such as study selection, data extraction and critical appraisal are all very resource intensive. Um, and so, as I said at the beginning, we're interested in methods and tools that will support these areas and, and make it all sort of much easier and more efficient. Um, and so we're working very closely with the International Collaboration for Automation of Systematic Reviews, um, ICESA. Um, because that work is going to really help to address those issues, particularly around um, the actual systematic review process. Um, and we would say also when people apply for funding to make sure that um, you know, administration and project management are properly funded, because without those areas, it, um, you're creating a very difficult task. Um, so thank you. And I'm now going to hand over to Inga. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, just to, 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 to remind you, every, anyone to know the who has uh, questions can put uh, in questions and answers part of their questions. And after we will have time to answer those questions, please. Uh, so now we will have final words from Clara Brunhofer, who is the vice chair of the action. She wants to say about the action success. Thank you so much, Inga, and, and uh, welcome everyone to our um, webinar here and also even if you weren't at the original webinar, um, delighted that you are listening to our recording. Um, as, as Inga was indicating, I want to tell you a bit about um, our wonderful cost action, EVBRES, standing for Evidence-Based Research. Um, we started out back in 2018 and embarked uh, in what eventually became a four and a half year journey. Then, because of course, uh, with the pandemic, um, there was a huge impact uh, on our activities, and therefore, COST um, agreed to extend our time by six months until mid April this year. Um, it was fantastic. Even at the uh, kickoff meeting uh, back in Brussels in, 20, in October 2018, we had um, over 30 countries. Uh, who had uh, already signed up to participate in this cost action. And I, I, I was delighted to hear that we were one of the leading cost actions in that, uh, you know, that there has been such an immense interest from the very start from so many different countries uh, within Europe. And as we learned, this wasn't only Europe, but really this is a, a, an issue that concerns all of uh, the global community. Of course, uh, we had to define our aim, and it was to encourage researchers and other stakeholders to use the already described evidence-based research approach while they carry out and support clinical research, aiming to avoid redundant research. You see us there, gathered there in Brussels, uh, very jolly, and I must say that this amazing level of energy and um, uh, just sheer enthusiasm really, really continued all the way through, even though, you know, through the pandemic, um, our uh, meetings ground to a standstill. Um, and, and just also indicate um, that um, we got the go ahead for this uh, cost action only at the third try. Hans put in a lot of effort with, uh, with, with, with our team to um, you know, apply for this um, cost funding, and uh, it only worked the third time round. So if you you know are trying again and again, um, you know keep keep at it, um, um, you know improving your submissions, and there's a big chance that eventually, if the issue is really um, of interest, it will be funded. Um, um, so. You can see here our 32 full member countries, our 16 inclusiveness target countries, so also very well represented here, and uh, the four neighboring countries and five international partner countries who, who were already recruited at the very start of the, uh, the action and, and, and stayed with us. And um, it, it's just a fantastic um, testimony to everybody's uh, input and effort. How did we go about structuring uh, our cost action? 
uh, the main aim, of course, was clear. But then we had to decide what are the different themes that would determine the structure and hierarchy within the, 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 the different um, uh, opportunities, challenges that EBR is currently facing. So that was a, a lot of um, discussion and brainstorming that was required in order to distill out these four key themes that we wanted to take forward through the um, cost action and then you know, translate it into our working groups. The first theme was around the raising awareness. So disseminating uh, the information among relevant stakeholders and then implement that through different uh, interventions. The second one was to um, develop further and then also work up into uh, training materials, teaching materials, um, dissemination materials, our EBR methods. The third one, as we already heard, was to look at the efficiency of conducting systematic reviews as an enabler of uh, the evidence-based research approach. And then the final one was then to conduct meta-research. So research about evidence-based research approach. And that, as I said, uh, translated into these objectives uh, that then also were taken forward through our working groups. Here you can see uh, our, our structure. Um, you know, the, the action management committee, of course, um, from all the participating countries. Um, what I wanted to, to point out is this very, very uh, important core team, um, um, you know, with, with the um, input from our chair, uh, vice chair, the grant holder manager representative, um, our program management group, um, where we had two members supporting us our science communication manager, Caroline, and then one uh, lead uh, or representative from each of the working groups. And with this core team, we were incredibly agile and met fairly frequently uh, all the way through um, at least once a month uh, to you know, review our status, to discuss any challenges that have come up and, and make plans for the future. Uh, we were also in constant exchange with our grant holder um, uh, and the H HVL in Bergen and um, also set up advisory and consultant groups in order to advise us and, and um, give advice on, on different areas of expertise. As you can see here, we um, didn't have just four working groups as such, but each of these working groups had at least two uh, but in some cases, three or four uh, activity groups that they were responsible for. And then, of course, we had uh, the grants committee who were uh, um, releasing calls for um, short-term scientific missions and also assess submissions for those, as well as um, requests to fund uh, ITC grants. I wanted to also show you, uh, sorry, sir, that some of these uh, are a bit, uh, you know, uh, very uh, light uh, in this particular screen, at least. Um, our um, cost action in numbers, you can see the number of 32 full member countries at kickoff in the left top corner, the four working groups, the 15 activity groups, the 65 very active members and you know even at our very last um, uh, action MC meeting we had 50 people attended. Um, the, you can see here the overall allocated uh, budget that we received from cost for these four and a half years and of course it's much lower than we would have probably received um, had the pandemic not happened because you know for two years um, our we weren't really able to meet at all, and therefore no, <clears throat> no expenses uh, were reimbursed. We had 24 core group and action MC meetings, uh, the same number um, by chance uh, of SCSMs and IDC grants. And what we did also with all this funding and with all this enthusiasm and input is to produce uh, an evidence-based research handbook uh, conduct seven training schools uh, utilizing uh, the, um, the materials that had been developed, 
that uh, received over uh, nearly 600 uh, training school registrants. We held three online evidence-based research conferences and published 37 scientific publications, including some uh, translations of our key paper that had been published in the BMJ in 2016. <clears throat> Overall, we reached over 20,000 people directly. And that uh, figure uh, Caroline put together for us just to indicate sort of what, what type of uh, outreach we did. If we start at the bottom, you know, we already know we had these 65 Everest participants. And then we had uh, an additional uh, uh, or overlapping a number of 998 uh, uh, subscribers to our newsletter. And these will also be the ones who will be informed about the steps um, happening following uh, the closure of our host action. As I said already, nearly 600 uh, enrolling into our training schools, uh, the three conferences attracting around 1,000 attendees, um, uh, ABR presentations having been given at conferences that had at least 1,500 participants, we received over 2,000 views for our YouTube uh, conference channel, over 4,000 downloads and website visits uh, of our, to, to, to see our EBR papers, and uh, over 1,200 hits via our social media. I've also added there our Twitter account and, of course, our website that we set up in order to showcase all the activities um, happening uh, during the course of the cost action. So do take a look um, in, in case you are still at the, the early journey of your own cost action. And, uh, you know, always also very happy uh, to answer additional questions, um, either now or then um, do follow up with us. I wanted to add a bit more information about our conferences because we are so, so um, proud of, of uh, that ach achievement. And you can see that even the, the very first one had a huge impact. We had uh, registrants from over um, 70 countries uh, across six continents um, and uh, a lot from, of them coming from China. And it also probably was, was um, um, caused because uh, we had um, a, a very prominent lecturer uh, from our uh, own Everest cost action. Uh, lecturing in China at the time. So she she was uh, very, very keen to ensure that as many of her students as possible could participate in this conference. And of course they came. Um, and then the next four leading there, UK, Norway, Mexico, and Spain. But you can see the distribution, you know, just amazing to see how many countries, even in those areas that are usually not very well reached uh, through activities. They, they still showed a lot of interest. Um, this is a very busy slide, I'm aware, but I'm sure we'll be sharing the decks afterwards with you. And you can just take a, a look in, if, in case you want to learn a bit more about uh, these, you know, the, the, the plenary um, uh, topics uh, and, and the, the actual, um, you know, presentations uh, of of these conferences. You can find all the information and, and, and the recordings of these on our website if you just look at the conference tab. Uh, the first conference theme was increasing the value of research. So very much around the, the themes that we've already heard about, around establishing the necessity for a new research study and its relevance, and together creating that value and avoiding waste. The second conference then focused on the question, where is the, the, the role and the place of evidence-based research in the evidence ecosystem? There are already so many different groups and players already working on evidence and around it and researching it. So where do we fit in? And then the third uh, conference uh, was a bit of a sort of uh, looking back, establishing where we are, and then trying to predict the future of evidence-based research, which was a really, really interesting challenge. And we, we had amazing presenters. 
And as you can see, they came from all uh, parts of the globe. And um, I've highlighted the top row, uh, which were our Everest members, so really participants in our cost action. But as you can see, it was a distribution of sort of one, one third and two thirds uh, from outside of Everest. So it was really indicating um, that this was a much wider issue than just our cost action, and that there was a lot of interest and a lot of um, uh, research already going on also in the area that uh, it was fantastic to hear about. Here are some of our key articles, and we worked very closely with the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology to publish some key papers, including the so-called evidence-based research series, uh, with paper one, looking at what is evidence-based research and why is it important. The second uh, paper in the series, uh, looking at you know, how to use evidence-based approach before a new study is conducted. And then uh, paper three, how to then place your new results into the context after the study is performed. So all of these aspects that already had been touched upon, and we were able to, to publish these papers to accompany them. But additional ones, of course, also coming out from our colleagues um, across uh, the cost action. And I'm, of course, particularly happy that we worked so well with the, uh, the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology on this, as I'm myself um, based at Elsevier. Um, some other key Everest publications I just wanted to also uh, um, um, pull some attention to, which is all aiming at um, evaluating systematic reviews um, and also looking at some of the barriers and facilitators for conducting uh, systematic evidence assessments, um, how to improve the study design, uh, meta research, uh, looking also at redundancy and use of systematic reviews and uh, the justification of research um, using systematic reviews. So very much all looking at the um, at similar areas and, and highlighting particular uh, facets of, of this important question. All of these uh, articles are, of course, uh, open access, uh, thanks to our cost funding. I also wanted to put up some of the, the photos we took. This is just a very small selection of them. And if you look at the ones sort of at the bottom, you can see a certain theme coming out in terms of a lot of um, lovely celebrations uh, of work. But as you can see towards the top there, there was a, a lot of hard work also going on. Um, in terms of uh, presentations, in terms of, of course, lots of Zoom meetings, uh, uh, but also, um, you know, discussions at conferences and really um, raising awareness of this problem with individual and groups of stakeholders. So what next for us? Um, the Our cost action actually arose from a very sort of initial little group of people who had this idea that uh, evidence-based research was the way forward and that there was a problem in terms of research waste and that the EBR approach would be a good way to address this. And that group uh, called itself the EBR network and was then instrumental in submitting all those three uh, cost uh, funding applications out of which then Everest arose. But it was always clear to us that, of course, Everest will come to an end and we would then need to think about continuity. And we've been, you know, discussing this for the last one or two years already, how best to go about it, because we knew that this cost action was ever only going to be a stepping stone uh, towards further uh, work in particular, as we wanted to grow this uh, beyond uh, a main focus on Europe uh, and then also beyond the focus of health science, which was very much what we did with Everest. Um, so our plans are now to establish a formal EBR network out of Everest. We, are, we want to uh, establish uh, this as a um, not-for-profit organization and uh, working uh, with a hosting institution. But of course, our aim, as we, we described earlier, 
um, raising awareness about the problem uh, among stakeholders um, and then working on solutions um, remains the same because from what we could see from the evidence, it is still sorely needed. So um, we set up a so-called founding steering committee for this new EBR network uh, and, and uh, got the approval for it at a first general assembly in October last year. We have been working in this founding steering committee on three strategy documents around the vision, mission, charter, and also the business model. Uh, we will be registering EBR Network, as I mentioned, as a nonprofit organization and uh, partnering with, again, with uh, our cost um, um, uh, already, you know, post as well for this particular network going forward. And um, we, are, we have um, ambitious plans for December 2023, where we will be organizing a training school. Uh, the fourth EBR conference, uh, which will be uh, mainly a, a, a one-day event with panel discussions, but also additional uh, abstracts and posters. And of course, holding a, a, a second General Assembly where the first proper steering group elections will take place. So really exciting times ahead for us. So if you feel that this is really something that um, is close to your heart. If you are in any way involved in research <laughs> uh, or are part of any other stakeholder group, um, do come and join us. <clears throat> if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, which also will have all the information about the upcoming activities and, and our plans for the future, do email Caroline using this address. Uh, and you can also, of course, uh, participate in research activities around EBR. There's a um, BMC systematic reviews thematic series call out at the moment, the role of systematic reviews in EBR. Um, so maybe that is something for you. And of course, do spread the word about EBR and start applying it, um, its approach to your own research. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you and uh, I'll hand back to Inga, thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, very interesting. Thank you for providing this beautiful story of cost action. So, um, and we, we say that it's important, very important for clinical research, right? But for other fields also, I think it's important to, to use this concept, right? And uh, here is a question, a uh, general question for the two health. Which other scientific disciplines intensively promote an evidence-based research approach? Can we answer this yeah. question? First? Yeah, thank you for a very, very, very good question. Uh, it's uh, give us an opportunity to uh, uh, really underline what Clara already have mentioned, that, uh, that actually the Everest, um, a theme of health science was really the case for starting someplace, uh, but we actually have a very strong uh, ambition to reach out to all the different scientific disciplines or faculties. So I think that's uh, that's really our aim. We also already have contact with people from many different areas. I can give you an example. We are planning uh, to make a conference in 2024 in Berlin about using systematic reviews when you're doing research to mitigate or adapt to climate changes. So that's just one example. We have had a course in, within social science and uh, they were really showing a very great, great interest and, and uh, also I, um, indicated that they were having the same problem of redundancy and not using systematic review when you are justifying your new study. So it's a really a very high priority for us to reach out beyond health. Health was just a case, just in quotation mark, of course, uh, because they will still be there, but um, it's really important to reach out to all. Very good question. Thank you very much. Just to add here that, of yeah. course, one of our... Um 
the founding steering committee members actually has strong links already to the uh, to the space agency the european space agency so so there's also already some sort of cross discipline uh, work that is uh, shaping up and i i believe there was also um, this wonderful collaboration in in uh, with the czech republic around educators so i think it it is it's already spreading into other disciplines, which is fantastic to see. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's clear. And I, I believe that others also, they will join uh, and they will use this concept to really, uh, it really advisable. Maybe they will join also your network, um, uh, which is uh, Everest or ABR network, right? It's a ABR network, network, yes. ABR network, yes. Okay, there is one question about your handbook. Where is the EverBR handbook available? It, it, it will be available on our website, uh, which, which uh, we have everest.eu, but uh, there will be a re reference to ebrnetwork.org, which will be our future network uh, website. And on the website, you will get access to to the handbook when it's it's all uh, final. We we are you know in the process of finalizing the handbook. Things takes time, and we have a, been a little delayed by the pandemic. So so uh, that's not fully accomplished. But we have uh, most of the chapters ready. It's just a matter of finalizing it. So look to the website, and you will find the handbook. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I don't know to summarize this, uh, if you have some other thoughts to, to really convey the, some information, please uh, you're, feel free to provide some yeah, more information about the action, about the topic, uh, but because I don't see any other questions. Ah, I see oh, now. Uh, one, new technology creates the needs for new data collection to verify or clarify existing answers to old questions in various fields. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm not sure if I fully uh, understand the question, but I can assure you, uh, as example that that uh, uh, Caroline was was mentioning, that we are actually uh, having a close collaboration with people using artificial intelligence to help us prepare the systematic reviews. And, and and we are really dealing with all ways, how, how all different ways that we can, you know, improve the efficiency of the production of what is needed for any researchers to justify and design the new study, or even when you are, you know, interpreting the new results in the context of the existing evidence. So, so uh, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, uh, it's really we are really aware of all the possibilities and and we will really take care of using them as much as possible because uh, the time issue is a very big challenge and barrier for for using a an EBR approach that's that's a fact there is answer so you answered the question so uh, thanks for this uh yeah uh, I don't know we still have some five minutes if you want us to use this platform to that's that's one more question i can see yeah yeah it it, it just i would just say this is a this is an area where we actually were giving a course in evidence-based research and the, and the use of systematic review for a group of of phd students working in social care and in social science scientists so it's actually very important in this area i think if i should if i should rank the different scientific areas i think that social science and social care is maybe the one who are closest and we have the most contact with and will will maybe be the first place for us to approach and really uh, you know enlarge uh, our uh, our field of interest in 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 that way so uh, it is it is the same kind of challenges you're also asking if if uh, there are any thoughts about performing it i think the same challenges we are facing in health is the same when you when you're working in social care maybe maybe caroline maybe you could add something to that no i think it's i think it's right i i yeah. 
I was actually just going to add because you mentioned about training yeah. um, and just to say that unfortunately all the training schools that we had through the action have now been filled up um, but we are going to continue running online training in EBR in the future um, and obviously as Hans just suggested we you know we can also do specific um, training programs for people in particular areas like the one that you ran in social care so I think if anybody listening is interested please just email me that's the Caroline Blaine at Ebrez um, dot eu um, and if you email me and give me just a little bit of information or just that you want to be on our mailing list to hear about sort of future training schools then then please do i think maybe maybe we we will just thank you all for attending this webinar and thank you to cost academy for giving us this opportunity i think it's a very good idea that that there are going some some information across the different cost actions that's actually can be very helpful in, in many ways. So thank you for that. And just yeah. to end, you know, really <clears throat> wishing you uh, a lot of joy and uh, and success with, with all your cost actions. Uh, it's a, such a rewarding journey as we have seen. We have made real friends through these, throughout these uh, yeah. four and a half years together. And, yeah. you know, the level of enthusiasm and, 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 efforts that has been shown throughout has just been phenomenal so we are so so truly grateful to all our members as well so yeah all the very best and and let's hope you will not have another pandemic to deal with because of course that <laughs> throws you back a bit sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you very much uh, for uh, yeah to attend this for who attended this webinar and thank you very much the Empress Action representatives, Hans, Caroline, uh, Clara, and we don't. Livia. Uh, Livia. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was very interesting. I hope it was very interesting for our attendees as well. And uh, yeah, did they, if they want to contact you, you are available for any uh, the collaboration, as you mentioned. Okay, thanks. Thank you.